first of all, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm usually never nervous before interviews, but we're sitting in a cinema this morning, we're sitting in Curzon Soho in London, and I wanted to ask you something really simple at first. Do you go to the cinema much still? Yeah. Yeah? They're all closed for a while. I still go and I'm happy I can still go. And, and to my dismay, not as many people as I thought are streaming back. What was your last very meaningful cinema experience? Meaningful by the movie or Meaningful by... for you for any reason. The experience itself, the movie, the audience maybe. I love big screens, I must say. I really like big screens. Whenever I can see movies on a bigger screen, then I choose the biggest screen. Mm -hmm. And I'm the guy who sits in the first row. Okay. I can, can be, can't be wide enough in front of me. So even in IMAX, I sit on the cheap places because I enjoy it to be in front of that big screen. Mm -hmm. So and I've seen many movies over the last few months. I saw some on big screen again. I haven't seen, I haven't seen Top Gun yet. I was waiting to see it in Berlin when I come back in two days. I'm a front row dweller myself. I like sitting on the front row so I can be as close as possible to the images. Well, the best seats are the second row. But if the second row doesn't allow you, if some theaters don't allow you to put your knees and foot over the seat in front of us, then the first, you have to choose the first. I like to just lounge in the second row and throw my feet over the not many people like that. <laughs> but no, there's nobody in front of me anyway. Yeah. Nobody ever sits in, the, sits in the front seats. And I wanted to, I rewatched a lot of your films before we had to do this. And I rewatched, I left Paris, Texas to the last one because I wanted to have the images very fresh in my mind before we spoke. I, one of the things I've always loved about your cinema is looking at America through a through an international and non-American filmmaker's eyes. And let's say European eyes. European eyes, yeah, let's say that. And I wanted to ask you about your relationship with that landscape. Now, what did you imagine it was gonna be like before you first started filming there? And has that relationship changed over the years? My imagination was filled up to the rim with things I've seen. The American West was the favorite thing I wanted to see when I was a kid. I saw westerns over westerns. Everything I loved was western. So finally, when I had the chance to make a film there, the last thing I wanted was, it to, was to be inundated with images of the west that I already knew. And I didn't want to make a film that was inspired by other movies. And I didn't want to film the west through the image of John Ford and, and Howard Hawks Anthony Mann and all the great Western directors, I wanted to see it for myself and wanted to be exposed to it as if I'd never seen a movie, which is not so easy. It's, you would say it's wishful thinking because I had seen this one. So I decided to do, to do a long travel in the West and traveled on my own for months and months. So basically every dust road and every highway in the West. And in the end, I knew I could see it on my own. And when we shot Paris, Texas, I did something very daring. I never designed any shot the night before, which I until then had always done. I'd always, at night before, prepared myself, and I knew I was going to put my camera there, and then this shot, and then do this close-up there. In Paris, Texas, because of the American West and the landscape, I always got there with my cameraman to the location, and then we said, now, how do we start? Where do we, how do we do this scene? Where do we do our white shots? We let the landscape of the American West do that part of the directing, mm -hmm. where to put the camera. Working with actors, and you know, we can talk about Harry Dean in particular. Do you find that helps them as well, that approach helps them with finding their character and their performance? Actors know not so much about their characters than some of them think they do, because most characters have biographies, and then they actors study the biography and get ready, and then they know, they think they know the character. 
I liked Harry Dean's approach, who was just blank. He knew in the beginning he was allowed to be just blank. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't speak. He had almost, he was catatonic. He almost forgot his past. And that was a beautiful state to start a film with and then define the character and slowly come, it would come back to him who he was and who he used to be and what he was trying to find back from his old life. That was beautiful. I don't like it if everybody knows before and what's happening. And actors are so, so well prepared and they know their character before we shoot the first scene. I don't know. Of course, it can be enriching, but it also can make it, the whole experience less exciting. Mm -hmm. yes. You want to discover who somebody is. And actors love shooting in chronological order. That's, they rarely do it, but it's a gift for them. They can build day to day, and mostly they have to, they shoot something in the middle, and they shoot the ending, and they shoot the beginning, and in the end nobody knows anymore, what, what, where am I today? What development of the story? If you shoot a film like Paris, Texas in chronological order, the entire crew always knows the story up to there. And then they want to know, what do we do tomorrow? Because they're curious, well, how does this go on? And I like that curiosity as a filmmaker because I think it's contagious also for the audience. They feel that these people lived the story and they didn't really have it already all planned. How important are you know, film preservations, restorations, retrospectives, not just of your own work, but also of other filmmakers' works? I love the history of cinema. And I was very happy that I had a, an access to it when I was a young moviegoer, mm -hmm. and that I discovered the Cinematheque, and that I could, that I saw more than a thousand films be, before I decided, well, maybe that's my life. And I think it's great to not just see what's coming out, but have a look at what, what has been done before. The history of cinema is extremely exciting. There's some amazing discoveries to be done if you start watching today. It's so much nicer than staying every day in the library and learning about history. And I, on that note, I wanted to ask you as well about the dedication of Wings of Desire. You dedicated to, to Ozu, to, to Fro, to Tarkovsky. And uh, what I wanted to ask you was how important are those friendships with other filmmakers, with other artists for your work? I feel cinema has given me so much and some of these directors have given me so much spiritual insight, insight into the world, into how you can look at life, how important love is, how amazing peace is. All these things I think I, think I really learned from movies. And movies have given me so I have, I have expanded my horizon so much. And also making movies, I mean. I owe so much to cinema that I want to give it back as much as possible. That I that's what my own films, for instance, I don't own them anymore. I put them all into the into a foundation so they would belong to themselves, and belonging to themselves, they belong to the audience. They belong. You're one of my co-owners because you've just seen Wings of Desire and therefore you're part of the owner because you made it happen by seeing it. And that's the only thing that films exist for. That they are made visible through the eyes of somebody. They don't exist because they're on the shelf. They don't even exist if they run through a projector. They exist if you see them. And the final question um, for a chat this morning would be, Considering that, what you've just said, and considering how in touch you are as well with, with young filmmakers learning and wanting to make their own work, what do you hope for the future of cinema? I so much hope that filmmaking doesn't get all so formulated. And I see this happening for the last 20 years, that movies in a strange way get more and more formulated. And that's one of the reasons I make so much documentaries lately, because that's a wide open field and you can almost invent what a documentary is with each film and I like that. And I like making a movie as if I didn't know anything, as if I didn't know how to do it. 
I don't want to repeat myself. I don't want to make the same movie twice. And that's one of the dangers. Already when I grew up, I made Paris, Texas, and then everybody thought, wow, well, this guy can do something really well. Now let's see how he does it again. And I tried, I couldn't live with that pressure, so I made the sheer opposite. And the most opposite film, I think, to Paris, Texas was Became Wings of Desire. And today I'm afraid there's a lot of good film schools in the world, in England and in Germany, and I think it's, they have the impression that there are certain rules and recipes how to make movies, and I just hope they just throw them all overboard and invent from scratch how to make each movie. And that right now, given that the streamers are so powerful and produce so much, I see more and more formulas at work instead of new imagination. That's a slightly hopeful note to end on, that there are filmmakers, young filmmakers I'm hopeful. They just have to dare. That's a good, um, that's a good ambition for them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna, for your time and for showing me <laughs> Silence of the Lambs. I love that tattoo. Thank you very much. I will, I will tell the artist that Wim van der Schlin would like to work. Thank you. That's the only one I could, div I could guess anyway. <laughs> Thank you it's for It's been a pleasure. Thank you me. so much for your time and for talking. Thanks, Anna. So Thanks. Thanks to your crew. Mm -hmm.